What's up guys, it's Chris Majestic, and today I wanna do a video that I've been meaning to do for a very long time, which is how to install or wire up a home theater receiver. Now I've done plenty of videos on home theater how-tos and different tutorials, and I even did a video on how to choose a receiver, but I've never done a video on how to wire it all up, and it can be a bit daunting if you've ever looked at the back of a home theater receiver, considering it's so many different ports and people don't know what they mean or they think they know and they may not have a good idea. So what I'm gonna do today is go over all of those ports, show you how to wire everything up and give you some best practices. So in this video, I'm gonna be using a Denon home theater receiver. It's an X3600H. It's a couple years old now, but it has pretty much most of the modern features that you would expect to see on any home theater receiver, even today. All right, so before I get started on how to install one of these, I wanna quickly go over some of the benefits of a home theater receiver. Now, probably the biggest benefit is gonna be more HDMI ports. So if you looked at any modern TV, you probably noticed that most TVs have three or four HDMI ports. Well, a home theater receiver is gonna give you anywhere from six to seven, eight, or even more HDMI ports. And some mid to high level home theater receivers are gonna give you multi-room access. This is gonna allow you to do things like play music in different parts of the house, maybe in one room and do something different in a different room. Another benefit to home theater receivers is that some of them offer multi-screen outputs. And this does get a little bit tricky when it comes to things like HDCP 2.2 or 2.3. So I will go into that a little bit later in the video, but either way you can connect multiple screens or multiple TVs to one of these receivers. Now I did say this is gonna be a short video and I'm gonna try to hold true to that, but before I go into all the ports in the back, I wanna take a quick moment to talk about today's video sponsor. This portion of today's video is sponsored by Pulseway. So one of my favorite hobbies is home networking. Considering I work full-time as an IT systems administrator, I've spent years building my home network and it consists of more equipment than most small businesses have. While with so many moving parts, I needed something to manage everything and Pulseway is a perfect option for this. Pulseway is a remote monitoring and IT management platform that makes it easy to manage an IT infrastructure, whether it be for home or for a business. With Pulseway, you can easily manage software applications, manage individual computers or servers, get alerts if something is wrong, and even create remediation jobs so you can easily fix issues with pre-written scripts, allowing you to work smarter instead of harder. And the best part is that you can do all of this right from your laptop or phone so you can easily manage your network no matter where you are. So if you're interested in taking your IT management to the next level, be sure to use the links in the video description to get started with Pulseway today. I want to thank Pulseway for sponsoring this portion of today's video and let's get back into it. All right, so let's get started and jump into these ports because there are quite a bit of them. So again, this is a Denon home theater receiver and a lot of Denon and Marantz home theater receivers are this way. They're gonna have your Bluetooth or Wi-Fi antennas in the top corners. So when you get this in the box, you'll see that these are just ports and you're gonna screw these antennas in. This is gonna give you your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connectivity or wireless connectivity. So starting up here in the corner is gonna be your digital audio inputs. Now I did a video on this recently where I talked about the best way to wire up your home theater receiver or soundbar if you're still using an older device device or something like that, like an older TV, and you wanna send your sound out from that, you can use those ports. You're gonna have a network port right here, and this is gonna be used for you to give internet connectivity to the receiver or network connectivity. That's gonna allow you to remotely control the receiver using certain apps or online and things like that, as well as for you to be able to use the internal built-in services like streaming services for you to stream music and do all sorts of cool things. And it's different for every home theater receiver, but again, that's just gonna give you connectivity to it. And then of course you have all of your HDMI inputs Inputs. Now, all of these ones here that are in the black section right here are all HDMI inputs. Now, obviously that part is pretty self-explanatory, but the part that's not really self-explanatory is the HDMI outputs. So as you can see here, you have an output that says zone two, and we talked about that earlier. We're talking about you can have multiple zones. You can also have multiple zones for a TV as well. So it's not just limited to speakers or sound. You also have your primary HDMI output, which is gonna be called monitor one. And as you can see, that is labeled ARC or eARC, and that's gonna be your primary ARC port, which is gonna allow you to get audio from your devices. Now I've also done videos on ARC and eARC, and I'll also link that in the video description as well. But this is basically, if you're not familiar with ARC or eARC, it's gonna allow you to send audio directly from your TV back to your receiver. So as you can see here, this is an HDMI output, meaning that you would connect your HDMI to your TV for you to be able to get video from your inputs here out to your TV, right? But the thing is, if you're using the built-in apps in your TV, or if you have a device that's connected directly to the TV itself, like a game console or something like that, you can actually send the audio out from the TV back out of the HDMI cable that's getting, that is using for video from the receiver and send that audio back 
right down into the receiver so that you can hear the audio that's coming from the apps from the TV. So really cool. And again, I've done videos on that. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I will put another link in the video description to that video as well. Then you also have monitor two, because as I mentioned, you can connect a separate monitor. Now it is really tricky as you're going to be limited sometimes in how you can output to that second monitor. There's a lot of content protection, HDCP is for content protection. So it's not going to really allow you to take the signal from one of these devices, depending on what you have hooked up and send it out to that second monitor. So for example, let's say you have a Blu-ray player connected to one of these inputs and then you're playing a Blu-ray and chances are it has HDCP protection on it. That's going to prevent you from outputting that video to all of these ports. It's going to allow you to send it out to one of the ports, but not all of them because it's going to try to prevent you from pirating that video. So don't think that just because you have multiple outputs here that you can take any content and send it out to multiple screens because that is not the case. It really depends on what you're using it for. Now, if you hooked up something like a camcorder or certain older game consoles or something that doesn't really care or doesn't have content protection or HDCP on it, you can output that to multiple screens without any issues. Just keep in mind that what you're playing may make a difference. And this includes things like streamers, like an Apple TV, as well as an Nvidia Shield or Roku. Those also do support content protection. So just keep that in mind. All right, moving back down onto the second row here, and we have some more old school connections here. So this is going to be pretty obvious. You have your FM connection as well, your AM. That's going to be for the built-in radio because most home theater receivers have a built-in radio in them. Then you have this red port here, which is labeled DC 12 volt trigger. And the trigger is going to be used for you to connect most of the time to an amplifier. So people it's like, okay, if I get an external amplifier and I connect it to this and I wire everything up, I don't want to leave the amplifier on all the time. So in order to get this to work, you would use a basic 3.5 millimeter cable, plug it into this port, plug the other end into your amplifier, and that's going to send a 12 volt signal out to your amplifier to tell it to turn on and off with the receiver. So whenever you turn your receiver on, the amplifier turns on. Whenever you turn your receiver off, it turns off the amp. All right, then you have your RS-232 port. This is going to be your serial connection that you can connect all different types of external controllers to it to be able to externally control this. That has been around for years. If you can't tell by how the port looks, there are still a ton of like automation products and other different integrators products that you can connect to your receiver and use RS-232 to control it or get data from it. All right, then we have the remote control IR input and outputs. So this is often used for if you have your home theater receiver hidden away in a closet or something like that, but you still want to be able to use infrared. It's going to allow you to use an external sensor, whether that means you run it somewhere in the closet and use RF, or if you have it out in the open where you run the sensor out somewhere where you can just see the sensor and aim your remote at that sensor instead of the unit itself. And talk about old school connections. Even though this is a newer home theater receiver, you still are going to get composite inputs. Now, this has been around for at least as long as I've been around. And if you're if newer than that, if you remember something like an older Xbox or some uh, HD DVD players or even some older DVD players, this is going to be component inputs. So it has a couple of component inputs for you to be able to use for you connect one of those older devices to it as well. So it's definitely nice that they allow you to connect older stuff to these receivers, because again, that's another benefit of it that I didn't mention. Aside from the other stuff we mentioned earlier, a home theater receiver is going to allow you to connect older stuff to it that a TV may not have. All right, moving down into the audio inputs, and you're going to see the very first one is going to be phono, and that is primarily used most of the time for like a record player. And that's why you see that ground signal right there next to it, because when you hook up a record player, you're going to want to hook up the ground cable to it. Um, and then you have all your other inputs, whether you want to hook up cable satellite, however you see fit those, all those inputs all in, in that black area right here. So starting here, going over are going to be all audio stereo audio inputs that you use an RCA cable for. And then when you get into this section, this is where a lot of people get a little bit confused. So these are pre outs, and this is not something that you see on all home theater receivers. You primarily see it on mid to higher range home theater receivers, and it's going to allow you to connect an external amplifier. So as you can see, all these ports are labeled and they all make sense with the very first one being zone two, allowing you to get all kinds of flexibility if you're going to have multiple zones in your house. But even though they're labeled, they are assignable. So even if you connect something different in here or whatever, you can still assign it how you see fit inside of the software on the receiver. So one thing that's pretty interesting about pre outs is that some home theater receivers, especially Denon is known for this, even though this is a 9.2 channel receiver, meaning it has nine channels of amplification, it can actually process up to 11 channels. So if you have an external 11 channel amplifier, you can connect all of your pre outs right out of here, what they call interconnects right into that amplifier and actually get this to process 11.2 channels, which is really cool. And not only that, but you can actually use a combination of an amplifier or the internal amps. So let's 
let's say you just want to amplify just a few of the channels, you can connect just a few interconnects here, and then you can use an external amplifier for just the front stage, which is really common. Maybe you get a three channel amp and you just do your left, right, and center, and that way you're not wasting all your money on these amps and not using them. All right, so moving on to the speaker terminals. Now, if you're not familiar with this type of speaker terminal, it's really simple. Now, obviously all the speaker terminals here are labeled, but it can get a bit tricky when you see things like height one and height two and all that. These don't necessarily have to be specific to what you want to use them for. They are assignable and it does say that there because even though you may have something hooked up to height one or height two, you can use for Dolby Atmos. You can always assign these speakers to be whatever you want in the software. And you have two ways of connecting speakers to these. You can either connect bare wire to it and the way you do that is to unscrew it to allow you to get that opening in the top. You're going to take your bare wire, usually maybe three quarters of an inch or something like that, push it down in there and then you're going to screw this down to tighten it down on the wire. That is the simplest way to do it, not necessarily the best way or what I usually recommend, but if you're in a pinch and you just wanna get it up and running, you can do that. The best way is actually to use what's called banana plugs. Now I've done videos on this in my how to build a home theater videos, but the way you use banana plugs is pretty simple. You're gonna strip your cable, push it up through the banana plug, spread your cable out evenly around it, and then screw the top back on. And once you do that, you're gonna plug that directly into the front. So once you plug your cable into the front of this, it's gonna be secure, it's gonna give you the best connection, and it's gonna allow you to be able to easily connect or disconnect them if you need to, as well as give you a solid connection. Now there are two last things that I wanna talk about. One of them is really simple and that's gonna be cooling. So once you have this home theater receiver set up, one of your biggest enemies with these is gonna be heat. So you definitely wanna to try to keep this thing as cool as possible and it usually has passive cooling so you wanna definitely try to get a fan for it if you're gonna be sitting it inside of a cabinet or somewhere where it can get really hot. And one of the easiest ways to deal with that is by using something like this. So this is an AC infinity fan. This is something that I've been using for years now. Now when I first started in home theater, I didn't have anything like this, but it's really, really simple. It's going to sit right on top of your home theater receiver. And even though I have it backwards here, it'll make sense, but it's basically going to have fans on the bottom here. So you can see I've been using this for a few years now, but it's going to basically take that air, take it out and suck it and push it out of the back of the unit. Now they have different versions of this, um, but this one is particularly sucking the air out, the heat out from the bottom and shooting it out the back. Some can take the air straight up out of it. It all depends on what you're looking to do with it, but either way, this is a fairly inexpensive way for you to keep this thing cool. And it's really nice because it has smarts built in so it knows how to keep your temperatures where they should be. All right, so once you have everything all hooked up, you got your cooling set up, you got your speakers and everything all ready to go, the last thing you need to do is run room correction. Now, when you turn your receiver on, they're usually gonna walk you through some type of a wizard. Do not skip that step. So to do that, you're gonna use the included microphone. Most of these home theater receivers come with a room correction microphone. You're gonna use the built-in little tripod thing that they come with, or you can put it on whatever tripod you want. Sit it in the different listening areas in your room and run the room correction. It's gonna play a weird sound through your speakers and it's gonna do a pretty good job usually depending on which receiver you have of doing some room correction. Another thing I wanna talk about while we're on the topic of setting up your home theater receiver is setting up crossovers. Now I'm not gonna to go too, too deep into this. There's plenty of videos out there on the internet on that. But what I usually recommend to most people is to run your room correction, but then you can put some sort of crossover on. Now this is all really gonna depend on what type of speakers you're using, whether you're using subwoofers, what kind of subs, whether you're using floor speakers, whether they have subs built in. There's a lot of different variables to consider when it comes to using crossovers or setting a low pass filter on your speakers. What that's gonna allow is gonna make sure that your floor speakers or your bookshelves, whatever you're using as your main front soundstage are not getting a ton of bass pushed through them. It's gonna give them more headroom so that they can get louder without a bunch of distortion. This is gonna allow your subs to do what they're meant to do, which is push bass and let your speakers do what they were meant to do, which is push everything else. But that's gonna pretty much do it for this video, guys. I'm really hoping that I didn't miss anything. I think I covered all the topics that I wanted to go over. As I always say, if you found this video helpful, please make sure you mash that like button for me. Make sure you comment as well. I do like to get to as many comments as I can to respond back to you guys so we can get a nice conversation started about this stuff. Again, I know home theater is really subjective, so everybody has their certain way of doing things. So I try to make these videos as universal as possible so that people aren't coming in like, that's the wrong way to do that, even though people are gonna do that either way. But at any rate, make sure you go ahead and mash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.